Hello, everyone. Welcome again. This is the community panel for DM1, where we have two speakers who will be speaking to you about navigating their life with DM. I'm Mindy Kim. I'm a support group facilitator. I also run Happy Hour, which you all should join me for. And uh, <laughs> welcome. Welcome to our professionals who are joining us as well, as Bill said. We have Dean Sage and Janine Desoy talking today. The first is going to be Dean. Dean is an attorney from here in San Diego. He was diagnosed with DM1 in 2009 and has been a big part of the MDF community ever since. He has attended nearly a dozen conferences, served as an MDF ambassador, and has previously spoken on many panels. Thank you, Bill, or Dean. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Dean Sage. I was diagnosed, like Mindy said, uh, around 12 years ago. And uh, in that time, I've been to 11 conferences. Um, we've been waiting for a few years for it to be in San Diego, and I sincerely ap apologize on behalf of San Diego for our unusual weather. Uh, it is not typically like this, um, so maybe you'll come again under better uh, circumstances. Um, so I tried to think of a framework to structure my presentation today and I was unsuccessful. So uh, forgive me in advance if I kind of jump around. But I thought I would start at the beginning um, with my diagnosis. And um, as many of you can relate to, it was very unexpected. And it was one of those uh, moments where once you figure out what it is and what myotonic dystrophy type one is, uh, so many things from your past sort of suddenly make sense. And all of the, so many puzzle pieces that were previously unexplained suddenly fit into place. Um, and I went through the hard process of, you know, assembling a care team, finding a neurologist and a cardiologist, and, and with the help of MDF and other research, we was able to determine what tests I need, what uh, annual visits I should be scheduling, and, and sort of all of those things. Um, I was, I got married a few months ago and thank you. Thank you. Uh, it wasn't a mistake. However, uh, switching to my husband's insurance was maybe a mistake uh, because I'm instantly back to reassembling a care team, which I had maybe naively thought was behind me. So even just this week, I had a first appointment with a neurologist um, and a cardiologist. Uh, sadly, doctors don't seem to know any more than they did 12 years ago. Um, but the difference is this time, I am armed with the knowledge about what medication I need and what tests I need and sort of can inform them. Uh, and as anybody who's part of MDF knows, that's one of the things that we learn early on is that you need to be prepared to know more than your doctors know. Um, and you need to be your own advocate and sort of tell your doctors what you need. Um, and oftentimes they're, they're happy if you can sort of do their job for them, I found. So I just sort of, I told my cardiologist, like, I need a halter test. I need an echocardiogram. I need an EKG at least once a year. And, you know, he took notes. So, so that was good. Uh, the neurologist I spoke to, I don't think he ever even used the words myotonic dystrophy. Um, at one point he did say, I'm sorry you had the disease. I feel bad. Like he had messed up my order at Applebee's. And I said, thank you. Um, I didn't get a free dessert or anything. So... So anyway, assembling your care team is important and can suck, but I think it's something we all have to go through and that's an important part of getting the care that we need. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is knowing your limitations. And that's something that's very hard for me. I struggle with that 
every day because I forget my limitations and I need to remind myself that no, I can't climb that ladder and hang the Christmas lights or things that are just way outside my realm of ability. Um, and there's little reminders all throughout the day, you know, opening a Coke bottle or, or turning a door handle or something that should be easy and it's not. And so those little reminders, I think, can, can build up over the day and just, uh, I don't know, kind of like beats you down over and over and over. Um, and so it's important to like have some patience with yourself and just um, know your limitations so maybe you can minimize um, those surprises and avoid, uh, injury. And there's a lot of little adaptations and, and hacks that, that we can do, um, depending on our individual ability or inability. So, um, I love a good whiteboard. I love making an unrealistic to-do list. And then it just sits there unchecked, and just reminds me every day of my failure. Um, but the whiteboard pens are so annoying because the, the caps are really hard to get off with your little weak fingers. And so I went on Amazon the other day and I found some like some clicker whiteboard pens and I was so happy. <laughs> and so like, I think we need to like look for those hacks and that's just one example, but we can find little things. There's jar openers and things like that, that just make life a little bit easier. And so I like celebrating those, those little things. And that was like the best $10 I've spent in a long time <laughs> on those pens. Um, so as in, uh, along the same lines of knowing your limitations, it's also important to know your abilities and what you still can do. Um, and so over time, you know, we do get weaker and there's less and less, it seems like the things that we can do, but there are still things that we can do and should do to stay active, stay engaged, um, stay moving as we've, as we've talked about at this conference. Um, so I also practice a little bit of, uh, gratitude on most days. I try to think of all the ways that I'm fortunate. Um, I have a great family and support system. Um, I'm able to work, which is pros and cons, I guess. Um, and uh, I've had to make changes to my lifestyle to accommodate for the disease. And one of the biggest changes that I've had to make is in sort of in regard to work where, um, you know, I was raised and we've been taught to, to work and be productive and do, do all the things. And I'm very much wired that way as well. I always want to be productive. I want to get things done. And uh, that's, that's hard these days. So I've had to sort of unlearn some of that mentality and relearn how to give myself space and permission to take breaks when I need to. Uh, during the pandemic, self-care was like a big, a big thing. And I'm, I think that's great. And I think for people with myotonic dystrophy in particular, um, we need to focus on self-care and just give ourselves the time and, and the grace to take those breaks. So, you know, if I'm working and I'm just not feeling it at the moment, or I'm just have that fatigue then I need to be okay and just say, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to listen to my true crime podcast and I'm going to turn my brain off and, and that's okay. Or I need to lay down and I'm going to listen to five Taylor Swift albums in their entirety. And that's okay. And I feel like the hardest part is, is believing that that is okay. And like giving yourself that, that space and that permission to take those breaks and then hopefully, uh, you know, resume with your daily activities. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, relationships with myotonic dystrophy. So um, before I was married, I was single, go figure. And um, I was on, you know, all the various 27 dating apps. 
Um, and it was, it was difficult to navigate uh, when to tell people that you have myotonic dystrophy and how to tell people. I think there's a panel on that about communication later today. Um, and I can't really speak to that because I don't know if I ever did figure out how to successfully navigate it. Um, but, you know, there's, there's friendships that I have that have changed since my diagnosis, um, either because people didn't, they don't understand and they don't necessarily care to understand, or uh, maybe they're afraid to understand or afraid to ask questions. Um, I have other friends that are, are the very interested and are very good about asking me how I'm doing, which is a horrible question to ask because I, it's like not like a quantitative answer that I can give. Um, but they ask me how I'm doing and that's, and that's great. And they understand sort of, they try to understand, right? What, what we're going through and, and what we're struggling with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I do, like I said, I do have a great group of friends and family that are very supportive. My family comes to the conferences um, and we, we, you know, it's very much a family affair that we uh, research things and try to find out um, the latest in treatments and cures. My brother is affected, my sister is not, um, and my mom is not affected. So, you know, for people that are unaffected, it's difficult for them to understand, but it's it's great when they make efforts to and and join you in sort of the struggle. Um, and in regard to relationships with people who are unaffected, I think it's also important to be patient, um, even when they tighten jars more than is absolutely necessary that takes like 200 pounds of torque pressure to open. I don't, I be patient, I guess. Uh, and I try to remind them that, you know, it doesn't need to be so tight all the time. Um, so little things like that. And just, uh, you know, as you progress, find those people, find those friends and those family members that are supportive and understanding and, you know, those are the people that you need to lean on and that you need to call when you're having a day. Um, and it's not like you're going to have, you're going to have a lot of other friends and maybe they don't understand as much or don't, you know, don't recognize or acknowledge some of your challenges. And that's, that's fine. And that's okay. Everybody has something. Um, but just know who your real core support group is because that's important and you will definitely need those people over time. So thank you for allowing me to speak today and thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Jean. I related to so much of what you said. Our next speaker today is Janine Desoy. She is 32 years old and lives just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. She was diagnosed with DM1 at 27, less than six months before her wedding. She works full-time as an RN in a major hospital in Boston, working three 12-hour shifts a week. She has a two-year-old unaffected son who is the sunshine of her life. This is her third conference and she's happy to be back. She runs the support group for Massachusetts, New England after taking over from Jim Halen and they're just getting up and running. She is thrilled to be at this conference with all of you here today, and she's looking forward to many future conferences. Thank you, Janine. So, hi, I'm Janine, as Mindy said. Um, today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about parenting with DM um, and sort of my, how it came, for me to be a parent. Um, I was lucky enough to be diagnosed before my husband and I started seriously thinking about kids. Um, I've been lucky in a lot of ways. Um, parenting is always tough, um, even without the added complexities of a chronic disease like this. Um, but I've been lucky in so many ways um, with my how it came to be for me. Um, for example, I, we, me and my husband had the time 
to discuss um, what we wanted our family to look like and the different ways that we could have a family. We had time to have the long conversations about what was gonna be the best way for us uh, from where we were and how to start our family. Um, we eventually decided that IVF with PGD was the best choice for us um, to have the life that we wanted to have. Um, so the IVF and the pregnancy both put a lot of stress on your body. And as a lot of us know, physiological stress can be a trigger for symptom progression. Um, and there is a lot of stress through the IVF process itself because they it throws your hormones all over the place. Um, and it's difficult, it's, it's, it's hard. And then throughout my pregnancy, you know, I had symptom progression. So I got weaker. Um, I had a lot, a lot more mitonia. Um, it became difficult for me to walk up a flight of stairs, uh, to do little things that you take for granted every day. Um, but I think what's really important is that you have a community around you to lean back on. And I think one of the most important things for me um, was to have a good care team that you trust, who knows you, your situation and what's not normal for you. Um, and I'm lucky enough that I have doctors who understand DM and um, are there to support me. Um, I went out of work early. Um, which was great. Um, my OB helped me file for like a medical leave before I was eligible to have like the maternity leave. Um, and that helped a lot. This was also when COVID was ramping up. Um, I had to spend a week in the hospital um, unexpectedly before being induced um, because I had severe preeclampsia which I guess is apparently not uncommon in patients with DM. Um, I was surprised to learn that. Um, and COVID of course further complicated everything. Um, I had had appointments booked before that had to be missed or pushed back. And so the, the preeclampsia wasn't caught until much later than it should have been. Um, I was in the hospital. I wasn't allowed to leave the room. The nurses were afraid to come in the room for very long because COVID was so unknown at that point. Um, and I wasn't allowed to have family visit. So I was alone in the room for a week before I was induced. Um, and that made an already hard situation even harder. I think what's important when you're going through something like this and, and just every day advocating for yourself, trusting your body and what it's telling you. Um, because I knew that something was not right. My blood pressure normally is very low and checking my blood pressure at home, it was high for me. It wasn't high for somebody else. It wasn't the normal high blood pressure that you see, but it was a lot higher than I am normally. And so, you know, if I had trusted myself, I would have been seen earlier. Um, I did have some complications during birth. I had a lot of bleeding. Um, I was almost at the point where they would give blood transfusion, um, but there were just, and, and he was, my child, Will, was three weeks early. So there were a lot of difficulties with that. Um, and then having a newborn is tough. Uh, but honestly, it's that point in my life seems easy compared to now. Um, he's always been a good sleeper, which I am so thankful for. Um, and having, I had a very supportive partner who's, also a full participant in the parenting process 
and that's made all the difference in the world. Um, and I've had a supportive community who, the, although COVID made this difficult because he, my son Will was born um, May, 2020. And it was the day after the peak of COVID in Massachusetts. So COVID made everything harder, but um, my family, my friends showed up for us whenever they could and however they could. Now, Will is a toddler. He is two years old and extremely active. He's getting stronger and bigger, it seems, by the day. And that makes it a little bit harder for me every day. Um, the stronger and bigger he gets, the harder it is for me to do the things that I want to do for him and with him. Um, it's, it's so hard when he runs at me with his arms up with a bright smile on his face and he just wants to be picked up and held. And that's getting harder for me to do, which is very difficult for me to, to process. Um, because if I want to hold him, I want to pick him up and do the things that he like be there for him the way he wants. And it's hard. It's it's difficult. Um, and then there's also, you know, the times where he doesn't want to do things and I have to wrestle him into his pajamas. And let me tell you, he has so many limbs. <laughs> um and he is so good and so strong at trying to do his best at not getting put into pajamas. Um, so something that I'm trying to do with him is teach him as much independence as he can very early um, so he can do the things with me that I want to do um, with him. So he's done everything early. Um, Walking up and down stairs, he can do by himself because um, it's difficult for me to carry him on the stairs. Um, but it so it helps me, but I feel also that it helps him um, in seeing he's discovering what he can do, and you know things that he didn't think he could do, and and now he's discovering that he can do those things um, with mom, um, and then. Sometimes we have to have a quiet day at home because um, that's all I am able to manage that day. And I'm trying to, you know, reconcile with myself that that's okay. Um, you know, sometimes that's just the way that it has to go that day. And that's, that's okay for me and for him. Um, but being a working parent, it feels a lot like working two full-time jobs. Um, my, my job as a nurse is, is physically, mentally, and emotionally demanding. Um, and sometimes I come home and I am just so spent from my day at, my, at the hospital. Um, so I'm trying really hard to separate my life at work and my life at home, but that can be tough, especially with a hard day at work doesn't just mean physically, it can be very emotionally hard uh, with the things that I see at work and have to do at work. Um, but trying to have those separate parts of my lives as best that I can is really important for me. Um, I know that there will come a day, um, maybe sooner than I'd like, when I won't be able to do the job that I do now. And so I'm trying my best to prepare for what that might look like. Um, but it sucks. I'll have limitations that keep me from doing the job that I love. Um, and that also means limitations for doing the things with my son that I love. Um, but having a community and a daycare that understands and is there to support me is wonderful but it's not it's not always enough and that's okay as the disease progresses I have been thinking what does that mean for my relationship with my child um, I don't know the answers 
and that's really scary. Um, I know it's hard to see the people you love struggling, and I don't want my son to have to feel that, but I know that it that's probably he, what he's going to have to deal with. Um, and luckily he has, you know, his father, his grandparents, his aunt, and his aunts and uncles to be there for him. Um, because a lot of my family is unaffected. It's, um, it's hard, but it's, I'm grateful that they're unaffected so they can be there for me and for my son. Um, so we're all trying to equip him with the skills that he's going to need um, to do things for himself um, and to be emotionally ready for difficult conversations. Um, but especially with the DM community, I know that you never have to do this on your own. There's support out there for parents and it's waiting for us when we need it. 